Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lunch with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Tercera Therapeutics. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. It is my pleasure to host you. I've been working with CCF for almost 10 years now to create video content, uh, treatment videos, documentaries, live video series like the one you're watching today all trying to achieve the same mission, which is to spread awareness and education about neuroendocrine tumors. Um, so we'd like to thank Tercera Therapeutics for their support of Lunch with the Experts. Without them, this, this series wouldn't be possible. And this series has been very impactful for myself as the host and from the feedback that we receive from you all as well, which makes us very happy here at the foundation. Before we get started, we have a little disclaimer we like to say at the top of every program. The opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience, have not been created or suggested by the sponsors, and CCF does not promote or endorse any of the views, opinions, or information uh, provided in the presentation. Audience members, that you all, should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. So again, uh, as I always like to, to reiterate, that last part is really the takeaway. We're going to give you some great advice. We're going to give you some good direction, hopefully answer some of your questions, but by no means do we know your specific case, and we're certainly not your home uh, medical team. So Anything that you get from this, take it back to your team, make a great plan to go forward. Um, okay, so very excited about today's guest. Today's guest is Angela Laffin. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me, Ray. Absolutely. Welcome to the program. Uh, so for, for those who, who aren't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about you know, your role in the neuroendocrine tumor community, how you see where you fit in, how you serve the community, where you work. Tell us all about yourself. Sure, yeah. Well, I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I've worked in oncology since 1989, so a long time. Um, and I currently work at UCSF. Mm -hmm. A lot of your listeners um, have probably come across Dr. Emily Bergsland, who is very well known in the neuroendocrine community. So I work with Dr. Bergsland and the rest of our neuroendocrine team. Um, I've been at UCSF, this is my second go around, so I actually went to school here and, and worked here, um, but I've been back here for about five years and prior to that I was working with Pam Coons, Pamela Coons at Stanford. So I've been um, part of the neuroendocrine community for quite a long time now. I'm pretty active with Nanex. Um, I've co-chaired the Allied Health um, program for their national conference, annual conference for the last few years. Um, so I'm a nurse practitioner and some of your participants, the, the viewers may have worked with a nurse practitioner or may not, depending on where they get their care. Mm -hmm. um, I see patients who are having treatment for their neuroendocrine tumor. And I also see people who have had the neuroendocrine tumor resected. So they have no evidence of neuroendocrine tumor anymore, mm -hmm. but they still need to be followed. Um, and so I see them in the context of a survivorship clinic. Yes. And in the work that I've done there, I realized that there is a huge population of neuroendocrine patients who are missing out on that holistic care because they're living with neuroendocrine tumors as a chronic illness. So because of that, um, at UCSF, I set up a neuroendocrine wellness clinic. And that is a consult clinic where people come um, to the clinic, they meet with a nurse practitioner, a social worker, a exercise counselor, a nutritionist, and a cancer resource specialist. So they spend 30 minutes with each of us. Um, we were doing that in person, but now given, given COVID, we've been doing it via telemedicine, which actually has been working pretty well. Mm -hmm. so, so that's in a nutshell what I do. Uh, I love it. I, I know that we're going to have a lot of questions. I have questions already that I'm, I'm excited to ask you because what you're talking about is a topic that comes up so frequently on the show 
quality of life. You know, you said that the term survivorship, and I'm so glad that this is an area in which you exist and you and you work and clearly you're passionate about because our attendees uh, and, and the friends of the foundation, the people who, who watch the show every week, this is something that, we, that that is important to them. We talk about a lot. So I'm very excited to, to dive into this today and I'm sure our, our participants are as well. So you all at home, this is, we're, we can talk about anything today. Miss Laffin has given us her time. Uh, she said, you know, nothing is off topic. She may not answer everything, <laughs> that's up to her. <laughs> But now you know what her specialty is, so you know the, the way that she can help you the most. And I think this is such an important topic. So go ahead and send in your questions. And if you're a regular, you know the drill. Let us know where you are in the world. Uh, I saw, who did I see uh, from frozen Wisconsin? Hey, Sarah, <laughs> you know, I'm in North Carolina and it's been threatening to snow all winter and it hasn't. And I bought a sled for my two-year-old daughter and I, and it's just raining. That's all it's been doing. So, uh, you know, the grass is always greener, uh, but I, I don't think I'd want to be frozen. So let us know where you are in the world. I love to see how far this program reaches every week. Go ahead and start sending in, in your questions. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to mention uh, from what you said um, is – Two, two of the friends of the foundation that were mentioned, Dr. Bergsland, Dr. Kuntz, and both uh, Dr. Kuntz was on the show in January and Dr. Bergsland will be on the show uh, in March. And so they, I, I, I just wanted to plus one their excellence. I love them to death. They are amazing at what they do. And they're also both featured in our video series, our treatment-based video series that we've been releasing this past year. We've done all sorts of topics, carcinoid syndrome, PRRT, surgery, lung nets, et cetera, et cetera. You can find that and all the Luncheon with the Experts on the videos tab here on the, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation Facebook page. So before we get started, just a few more announcements. This is something, um, uh, we, you know, we may not get to everybody's questions. We really try hard to, of course, um, but inevitably you all have a lot of them. And so we, we don't get to all of them. If you have follow-up questions, or if we didn't get to your question, just know you can always reach out to Carcinoid Cancer Foundation here on their Facebook page. You can go to their website, carcinoid.org. They will get you the information that, that you seek. Um, and while we're asking questions today, I've said this every week, I'll continue to, because you all have been doing a great job of it and it helps me do my job better which is to serve you. So if you see a question in the comments that you also have or you're interested in and you would also like to know more about, just like that comment, love it, any of the emojis that they get that Facebook allows you to use, it allows me to see that there's a demand for that question. It kind of upvotes it. And, and so I'll make sure to ask it, okay? So that, that's been helping me a lot. So thank you all for, for doing that. Uh, we also, uh, uh, Angela mentioned NANETS, which is the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, friends of the foundation as well. We have an announcement from them. They have issued a position statement on COVID-19 vaccine for neuroendocrine tumors, uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma patients. So uh, I know that's a question a lot of you all have. It's been coming up every week since the vaccine has been released. So we, we're going to post a link to that in the comments so you can read it and download uh, that information, their, their position statement. That, that I think that would be really helpful. That being said, any other links, anything, uh, Ms. Laffin, uh, references, articles, treatments, blogs, anything like that, we're going to try our best to post those in the comments too, so you can, you can have those resources right here. Finally, before we get started, last question, have you downloaded CCF's free net uh, cancer health storylines app? This app really helps you record your symptoms, your medications, your nutritional concerns, moods, everything else, and it's, it's been really helpful for people, so if you haven't, check that out as well. So um, a couple of questions. I've got a lot of questions because I'm not a, a medical expert. So what excites me the most is this element of quality of life. I'm a storyteller. I'm a filmmaker. I'm, I'm, a, I'm for humans. I'm for people. And so what I love about this community, even from the medical e experts, is it seems that everybody tends to have the patient's priorities in mind. Every case is unique, but also every patient is unique. Um, so First of all, before we start diving deep into that, I want to learn a little bit more about the wellness clinic that you established, like why you felt the need to establish that and what the real mission of that is. What are you trying to accomplish with that? I, I see the value in that, but I want to learn more about that. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there haven't been a lot of studies done, but there have been some, some studies done that tell us what I think we all know, that there are a lot of unmet needs of this patient population. 
and just providing treatment for the neuroendocrine tumour is not enough. We know that patients make huge changes in their life and it's, and it's not just the patients that, that the change is happening to. It's their caregiver, it's their kids, so it's true. their family, it's their change in, you know, in the family structure because maybe they can't work anymore. All of those things are really, really important. And fortunately, patients live for a long time, even if they have metastatic disease. So we really want to make sure that patients have the best quality of life possible. And I think that that gets forgotten about when we're trying to treat the actual tumor. Sure. Sometimes those other things take a back seat. So it's, you know, my, my background, as I said, I, I run another survivorship clinic and I've, I have a lot of interest in integrative therapies as well. Um, so sort of looking at the patient in a more holistic way. So I really wanted a way that we could be proactive mm. with the patient. So, you know, we, we're very reactive in, in the way that we treat people. So, oh, you're about to lose your house. Oh, well, we better get on that, right? So it, we want to get to the patient and help them before the crisis happens. So that was sort of the impetus for starting the wellness clinic. And, um, you know, I had what I thought should be done, but I really wanted to hear from the patients what they wanted. So we did a focus group with um, patients from Norkel Carsonet, mm -hmm. which is our local um, Bay Area support group, which are very, very active support group and um, I explained to them you know what survivorship means how it's sort of interpreted in the community the word and overwhelmingly because truly survivorship is from the time you're diagnosed yep. that's the true definition of survivorship till the end of life um, but it's not the way we deliver survivorship care. It's often after treatment's finished. So when, when I spoke to the participants in the support group about the term survivorship, that overwhelmingly they said, I do, not, I do not identify with that word. And that was why we called it the wellness clinic and not a survivorship clinic. Interesting. And then as far as the who is part of the wellness clinic, um, the role of the nurse practitioner, which is myself, is really to help people, provide them with the opportunity to talk about what neuroendocrine tumours are. When I meet people, some people have had their diagnosis for 10 years mm -hmm. and they actually really haven't spoken about like their pathology and what that all meant for a very, very long time. Other people are newly diagnosed. So the time is really just what you know, what do you want to talk about with neuroendocrine tumors? Then with the social worker, we felt that that was a really important part of the team because they can help with financial aspects. They can help with caregiver um, aspects, with insurance, um, with some counseling. Um, so they are obviously very important. The cancer resource specialists are um, specialists at UCSF that really know all of the resources available, support groups and, you know, legal aid and all of the things that, that possibly are available to our patients. Nutrition obviously is a huge part of neuroendocrine tumours, especially those patients living with carcinoid syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's also really, really important too because we know that patients with neuroendocrine tumours are more likely to develop a second cancer. So that's a second primary cancer. Breast cancer, colorectal cancer and renal cancer are the top three in some of the studies that have been done. So we also know that a lot of those cancers, certainly colorectal cancer and breast cancer, are a lot of it is impacted by lifestyle. So if you can get people eating well, then potentially you can decrease the risk of these patients who are living with their neuroendocrine tumour 
you can decrease the risk of them developing a second cancer or other illnesses such as heart disease or diabetes. The things that we forget about when we're dealing with a non-curable cancer, mm -hmm. but it may not be the, the neuroendocrine tumor that becomes a problem in their life. If they have a heart attack, that's the problem. So really trying to, to impart to patients that we need to keep you well to prevent other illnesses and also to keep you strong and healthy so that you can have other treatments for your neuroendocrine tumor. And exercise plays into that as well. Sure, absolutely. So that's sort of, sorry, that was a, a long yeah. way of explaining it, but that's that was sort of the, the, the impetus for for starting the wellness clinic and what we're trying to achieve mm -hmm. through having people come. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's important to lay that foundation and that groundwork for people. And it, everything you said is so is so accurate. And they're topics that come up on the show a lot. So I know that they're going to mean um, mean a lot to the people attending today. That being said, everybody, I start to, I'm seeing the questions start to come in. So we're going to go ahead and start taking some of those audience questions. And then our numbers are rising, which is looking good. Do me a favor, everyone at home. I the, one of the things I love so much about this community is that it is a community. So I know some of you all know people out there, whether support group leaders, caregivers, other patients that would benefit from this, the video is going to be evergreen. You can always refer back to it, but this one-on-one -on -one time is really what's so unique about the program, about lunching with the experts that they can get questions across. It's kind of, you know, like a, like a one-on-one -on -one time, at least virtually. So do me a favor. If you know someone who would benefit from this time, this hour that we have, this 45 minutes left, Tag them uh, in the comments, or you can share this video to their page. Let's try to get as many people as we can here, because not only uh, not only does that give them the opportunity to ask questions, it, it continues to build the community that exists there in the comments. And, and I think a lot of the value from the show comes from you all sharing your experiences, as well as our guest presenter sharing, sharing their information. So do that for me. We're going to go ahead and start taking some questions. Um, are you comfortable, um, Angela, taking questions of, about treatment and things like that? Sure. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. PRRT is something that comes up a lot as well. So if you if you're you know comfortable with that, I've I've got some uh, already lined up. Um, so Timothy asks, is there any indication for going right to PRRT uh, as opposed to sandostatin? I have lots of tumors in my liver, so it's not uh, operable. But I was thinking, why not PRRT to rid the body of the existing tumors first? Any thoughts? PRRT is, you know, it's new in this country, right? It's been done in Europe for a really long time. Right. Um, and PRRT is not without risk. Um, so I think that you need to think about, you would need to discuss with your provider about the risks and benefits of doing PRRT. In, generally at our institution, we like people to have had sandostatin first. People can live for a really, really long time on sandostatin with very stable disease. Um, and we know that sandostatin is very well tolerated, or the somatostatin analogs are very well tolerated. Um, so I think it's a risk benefit discussion. You also need to have enough tumour to have PRRT. Um, it's generally not done on people who don't have a big tumour volume. So it's definitely a risk benefit discussion, but it sounds like it'll probably be in your treatment somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that point, that kind of risk benefit analysis is comes up a lot in this disease in terms of what treatment we should, we should pursue. So I think that's such a good uh, general, you know, point to make even through this uh, specific PRT lens, if you will. Um, and actually I have another question that's kind of similar to where you were going uh, with, um, you know, the size of the, of the tumors. So Jackie asks, I was told I have uh, two neuroendocrine tumors in my stomach, but the doctors say that they are small enough that we can just keep watching them. And this is an interesting question. I bet a lot of people have this. So the doctor said, come back in six months and we'll do another endoscopy and then we'll check them out again. Why are they not concerned? Isn't cancer a scary thing and, sh and shouldn't something be done to get them out? Yeah, well, so it sounds like maybe it's a, it's a gastric carcinoid if you're talking about the stomach. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming it's inside the stomach, not in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be really scary for people to be told, 
you know, yeah, you've got cancer, come back in six months. Like that, that definitely I understand how that could be a scary thing to hear. Um, the difference between stomach cancer, gastric cancer, and a gastric carcinoid is the rate that they grow. Mm. Um, so stomach cancer, gastric cancer grows very quickly. You wouldn't be waiting for six months. But carcinoid in the stomach can be really, really slow growing. Um, so that would be, once again, a conversation with the gastroenterologist or the medical oncologist. Can you remove it? How quickly is it growing? That would also depend on what the pathology shows. Mm -hmm. So um, once again, it, it gets back to neuroendocrine tumors being, you know, the zebra, right? Like every case is so different. Um, but so it really has to be a conversation with your team to understand the pathology of the tumors, how quickly they're growing and what are the risks and benefits of removing versus leaving them there. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie, for your question. Hope that helps. Uh, if you have follow-up questions, go ahead and send them. Uh, send them to us while we're still here. Uh, th this, uh, this next uh, topic, I see a lot of people talking about how cold it is where they are, Kansas and Wisconsin and Indiana, but that's probably my fault for mentioning that at the top of the program. <laughs> but a question did arise out of it that it's kind of a unique question. Uh, Claire says, we have continuous snow, which leads me to a question. Does cold uh, affect neuroendocrine tumors or damp weather? Any, ever heard of anything like that? No, yeah. I have not. I have not. No. You know, I mean, the thing with neuroendocrine tumors is because they're rare, mm -hmm. even though a lot of people are living with them, right, but they're still rare tumors, they have not been studied the way breast cancer, Good point. colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, any of those other tumors, more common tumors have been studied. And with regard to lifestyle, mm -hmm. We know very, we have good research showing if you exercise, if you eat mainly a plant-based diet with lean proteins, um, if you get adequate sleep, if you manage your stress, you can decrease either the development of those more common cancers and also decrease the chance of them coming back. And with colon cancer, there's also some evidence showing that people who exercise can actually slow down the progression of their tumours, even when they're living with metastatic disease. Wow. We don't know that about neuroendocrine tumours, but it's really important information that we find out because when we know that information, we can then really put emphasis behind making lifestyle changes um, to help influence the tumours, right? Um, we at, at UCSF, we're actually going to be doing a study looking at those aspects. So it's going to look at um, quality of life, um, symptoms, um, lifestyle, what people do in their life yep. to get a large sort of pool of information that we can then analyze and that's how we've been able to get the information about exercise and colon cancer you get enough people to tell you what to do and then you look at the outcomes yeah, yeah. so um the study will be it'll be um surveys that patients fill out it'll be for people who are living with advanced neuroendocrine tumors or um unresectable neuroendocrine tumors. It's going to be called ENET. And um, it's not quite open yet, but if people are interested, yeah. it, they can email neuroendocrine at ucsf.edu. Great. Uh, I was going to ask that. I'm sure people would be interested. So again, that email was neuroendocrine mm -hmm. at ucsf.edu. Awesome. I, that's, that's great to hear. And I think we'll, we'll try to get that, um, that uh, email in the comments as well, every, everybody. I think that's very, very cool to, to hear. And, you know, this is uh, apropos of what we were just saying. Our next question from Dave talks about food. Um, this is also a topic that comes up a lot. Uh, we have some videos out there about nutrition. 
Um, but Dave says my pancreatic nets have caused some foods to aggravate, um, abdominal pain, uh, e.g. dairy products. Um, are the foods that trigger the pain likely to change? I think some foods that were once safe now trigger the pain. So it's hard for me to tell. I was diagnosed four years ago. My tumors are not resectable. Yep. Yep. So, you know, one of the things that, um, is important if Dave had access to a nutritionist that knows about neuroendocrine tumors, mm -hmm. that would be fabulous. And that I have heard that over and over again when people come to our wellness clinic, that it is so nice to be talking to healthcare providers who know what neuroendocrine tumors are and understand the intricacies of them. So if Dave had access to a nutritionist who understood neuroendocrine tumors, that would be great. Um, I think often nutritionists really love you to keep a food diary of what it is that you think is triggering the abdominal pain. When I eat this, this is the symptom that I have. And then also keeping track of what your bowel movements are like because we can tell a lot from what people are able to absorb mm -hmm. by their bowel movements. So some people get pancreatic insufficiency, so they're not producing the enzymes that normally the pancreas would produce to help digest food. And therefore, they're just not digesting it properly and that could be manifested with abdominal pain or bloating or maybe even some fatty stool, so some oil on the sort of the water in the, um, in the toilet bowl, things like that. So food diary, trying to find a nutritionist that understands neuroendocrine tumours and maybe keeping um, a, a, in that diary document what the stool the bowel movements like. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. And also, um, we had about a month ago on the show, we had Tara Wyand. Uh, you can go to the videos tab. We talked all about nutrition, the whole, the whole episode, pretty much. Um, you can go to the videos tab here on the Facebook page and see that it's about a month ago. Um, and then also for people who don't have Facebook, and this is for, for this episode as well, we always repurpose the episodes and, and republish them on YouTube starting the Monday following. So in a few days, this episode and, and all the other ones are up there. If you know someone who doesn't have Facebook, who still wants to access this information, but Dave, uh, we got that a lot. We've got videos on nutrition and that's the most recent one that we did that might, uh, that might also help you. So feel free, feel free to check that out and let us know. Uh, next question from Donna. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, the likelihood of developing a second cancer. Is there any data about carcinoids being a second cancer? I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 92 and, 90, and 97 and then carcinoid uh, tumor in 2007. I've been told there's no relationship, just bad luck. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, that, that's actually a good question, and I don't know the answer. So the, the question is, is the carcinoid the second tumour, the second primary tumour? Mm. And I don't know about that. Um, definitely if I met somebody who had two breast cancer diagnoses and a carcinoid tumour um, diagnosis, they would definitely be going to, and having genetic counselling and genetic testing done. Um, so um, that that's definitely where I would go um, with that. Got it. Thank you. Um, real quick, Angela, there's a there's a lot of people who are just saying they're loving the content that you're delivering right now. And by the way, audience, an easy way you can let us know if we're doing a great job. Angela, you can't see it, but I will let you know. You can send the little heart emojis and the like emojis whenever you get some information that is helpful and valuable it's a kind of a visual cue and lets us know that, Hey, that, that moment was good for you. But I've seen a lot of people saying they're, they're loving what you're talking about and saying it would be so helpful to have this guy, professional guidance. One person said, I need you. <laughs> so uh, let's take a moment. Is, is there a way that people, what is the best way for people to work with you if, if they wanted to? So unfortunately um, we only see patients who are UCSF patients. Okay. Um, that being said, um, 
you or, know, or what would your suggestion be for, you know, for someone who is in a different state, um, you know, that, that is loving the information we're talking about that you have with the wellness clinic and, and all that you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, so I have presented the concept of, of the wellness clinic at the Nanette's meeting in October mm -hmm. um, of last year. And I'm, you know, part of the mission, what CCF is doing and all the support groups is to raise awareness, right? Yeah. We need people to know what neuroendocrine tumours are. We need people to understand your know, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumour, not pancreas cancer. You know, it, we need to raise awareness. And I think in talking about the concept of a wellness clinic um, at meetings like Nanette's, the, the idea and hope would be that other institutions would see the benefit that our patients at UCSF are getting from the wellness clinic and think about establishing wellness clinics within their mm -hmm. centres. Is your wellness clinic, is it virtual now or you is it still? It is virtual, I yeah. I wonder if there would be a way to kind of create a network of that, you know, something on a larger scale that was either hospitals working together to create one big virtual one versus just their individualized ones. Uh, one thing the pandemic has presented to us is an opportunity to do things more efficiently and effectively. Luncheon with the experts being a perfect example of that. Yeah. So, yeah. I totally agree. And I think that, um, you know, we never want to try and reinvent the wheel, right? We need to build off each other's you know, trial and error and successes and failures and and hopefully be able to provide, like, the best care that we can to the patients. So um, let me think about it. Let yeah, me, try, there's, let, there's let me of, try and get creative. There's a lot of opportunity out there for, for using this technology to share this information and our stories with each other now that have presented themselves, especially in the past couple, you know, year or two. Yeah. Um, so it might be cool to, to figure out how to establish a, a bigger network of wellness clinics. Anyway, for, for another day, a problem for us to solve another day, yes. but an opportunity, I think, none, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think you know, maybe getting the, um, you know, the support groups and, you know, organizations like Nanets or CCF or other big organizations on board to try and think about how we could do that. And especially, you know, we know this, that patients in community settings, it's, it's different in the community setting because often they might be the only patient in the general oncology practice that has neuroendocrine tumors and they may live a really long way away mm -hmm. um, and so don't have as, a, access to neuroendocrine specialists. And as you said, Rain, this, this technology that we have now and people becoming more comfortable with the concept of telemedicine um, and Zoom calls, hopefully we can reach a larger population of people. I think so. I think so. Um, next question. This question is from Ruth. Ruth says, my husband is now getting his fourth uh, PRT uh, treatment and he's lost quite a bit of weight. He has an appetite, but, uh, and eats a lot, but he can't, it still can't keep him from losing weight. Any ideas on, on how to pack the pounds on even, you know, you have an appetite, but, but it's, you know, you're kind of going in reverse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the first thing would, well, multiple things. One would be to make sure that the foods that are being eaten are calorie dense. Um, and, but they need to be healthy food. Like this concept of that, you know, I, I still hear patients being told this, but it feels to me so old school because when I started in oncology, I said the same thing, you know, eat ice cream, eat burgers, eat, you know, like, no, you, there are really good calorie dense foods that are very healthy for you. So eating calorie dense foods that are healthy um, is really important. But the other thing that would be really important is to work out whether or not your husband is actually absorbing the nutrients because mm. there is a possibility that he is eating the food you know, if he doesn't have the right enzymes to break down the food or if he's having diarrhea or things like that, 
he will not be absorbing those nutrients and then he'll be either not maintain he'll be just keeping stable not gaining weight or losing weight so that that's an outstanding point that i haven't thought of and i i know it resonated with the people too because i saw a flood of those hearts come in when you said that that's i haven't you know the calorie dense you know food makes total sense but i never thought about also making sure that he's actually absorbing the food that he's taking in that's such a great point um can we pause for a moment on the calorie dense uh dense foods i think that's a great point you made too when my father got cancer years ago ice cream was like one of the things they said they're just trying to pack on you know things as as easily as possible but i agree with you it's like well that's not necessarily the the, the best thing what are some examples of healthier um uh, calorie dense foods. If I had to guess with the limited knowledge I, I have, I might guess a uh, healthy nut butter or something like that. Is that, is yeah. that, is that yeah. okay, cool. Nut, nut butters, nuts themselves, mm -hmm. you know, like macadamia nuts, cashew right. nuts, That's really what I high in calorie, avocados are, are great calorie dense foods. The um, dairy products that are full fat dairy products, you know, mm -hmm. like cottage cheese or, you know, full fat Greek yogurt, those totally. type of things um, are calorie dense. You, any of those things with oils in them, like good oils, um, even eating things like, you know, whole wheat pastas, those type of things. So you're getting the fiber from it. So it's not just this load of, refined fiber and which does crazy things to your glucose and but eating um like whole wheat whole wheat pasta with some pesto that has you know like olive oil and some cheese and things like that in it so <laughs> think, thinking about those types of foods like mm -hmm. how much in a small portion how many calories am i getting yes. in that yeah, you're making me hungry over here. Uh, <laughs> quick, quick, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the CEO of Carson Cancer Foundation, Keith Warner, Dr. Richard uh, Warner's son. Uh, he actually, in some of my trips to Denver doing work for the foundation, got me into making my own uh, cashew butter, macadamia nut butter. He's very, that's something that he loves to do and uh, was one of the first places at his house where I realized how, how easy that is. So now I, I, I do it myself. Um, so just quick shout out to him back to the program. You mentioned something about fiber, which is perfect because Bob, ha Bob, and a lot of people, it seems has a question about that. How can you eat a plant-based diet? Bob asks when you, when you can't eat so many vegetables due to their fiber content. So I avoid, yeah. So you know where I'm going. I see you nodding. So he says, I avoid lettuce, broccoli, onions, cauliflower, lentils due to regular bouts of loose stools. I know this is a common problem. What's your thought on that? The counter to the to the fiber argument? Yeah, you know, and I mean, it's difficult, right? Like, um, if people have diarrhea, either related to calcium syndrome or pancreatic insufficiency, or some reason, um, then their diet it's not as easy as saying, "Oh, eat this plant based diet with you know lots of fruits and vegetables." Um, but you know, you can get fiber from a lot of different sources so you can get fiber from whole grains mm -hmm. um so you can get it from, so that would be like oats barley farro quinoa a good source of fiber are chia seeds which are those little they almost look like poppy seeds um, and they, they have a lot of fiber in them and you can sprinkle them on anything, on yogurt, on um, salads, which it sounds like it's difficult to eat. The other thing um, where you can get fiber is beans, um, legumes. Yep. Um, your your um, column mentioned that it's difficult to eat lentils, so beans right. might be a little bit difficult. Um, but you could maybe just eat a small portion of beans. Um, and then fruits and vegetables have, like raspberries are very high in fiber. Often people with diarrhea, it's really hard to eat um, raw foods, so like salads or um, things, he mentioned broccoli. But sometimes if they're cooked, you can still get the fiber from them, but um, they're easier to digest and they don't cause as much as much diarrhea yeah that's something i've heard a lot a, a lot as well from other nutritionists um 
that that we've had on the show or other programs that we've done that's a, that's a good point too and cooking it's it's not like a binary thing like where it's raw or then cooked to death there's a whole spectrum you know so exactly. cooking it lightly you might find that middle ground where it doesn't trigger as much and and then uh like you said it doesn't take out all the nutrients that are actually uh, you know process out all the nutrients that are actually uh, inherently in the in the food product so yeah yeah. That's a good point. Um, sticking with the same kind of topic, we've talked a lot about exercise and, 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 and um, eating well and this holistic approach. Claire says, and she's not the only one I know that experiences this, exercise always brings on diarrhea with me and it doesn't matter about what, what I'm eating, what diet. Um, are there tamer exercises or, or ones that trigger this sort of effect more? And I've heard yeah. this before. Some people struggle with strenuous activity. Um, any suggestions on what exercises and might not trigger that? Yeah, well, um, definitely. We know that exercise can be a trigger for, for carcinoid syndrome. Um, so number one, back to the back to that keeping the diary of like what can I do and, and how do I feel is really important to understand because as we said, it's a very individual thing, right? How people actually respond mm -hmm. to different foods and different environments. Um, so exercise, the recommendations for exercise are 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. So about 30 minutes, five days a week. That does not have to be in one sitting. Mm -hmm. You do not have to do 30 minutes of exercise all at once. So you could do 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Now, maybe walking is fine, but running is just too stimulating. Walking is great and you can, you know, try and walk with some intensity that you actually get your heart rate up and that your breathing is a little bit laboured, but you can still have a conversation um, if, you, if you're walking with someone. Maybe walking is, you can't do that because you don't want to be so far from the bathroom. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things you can do at home. The other thing that you can do with exercise is focus more on getting your heart rate up through doing, um, like resistance work. So, you know, holding a plank, maybe on your knees or, you know, a full plank, like a yoga plank or, yes just holding yourself up against the wall or standing at the bench and squatting down and just sort of holding that position. Those sort of things that it's really, really important if you don't have adequate nutrition, maybe because you're having diarrhea, that you focus on maintaining your muscle mass, right, and, and staying strong. And so we have to do that through some resistance work. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think exercise does not have to be going for a 30 minute run. Right. Totally. I can't plus one that enough. Uh, I used to be a personal trainer, so this is something I can actually speak to with some knowledge. Um, and you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, a hundred percent. And I was going to say too, it's trial and error. It's figuring out what works for you. You know, maybe walking is it and, and, and not running, but definitely, agree with the resistance training and often what people don't understand is you get your heart rate up through those isometric exercises you were talking about and you don't have to be jumping around doing burpees or these things that has your whole system you know jarring like that it, exactly. totally people people don't understand how uh how much it you know a plank or something like that does get your heart rate up or just sitting in a squat or anything like that so a hundred percent recommend recommend that as well any body weight exercises you're not doing heavy lifts you're not doing sprints and running, you know, 20 miles or anything like that. Find that, that middle ground of, of what's achievable, what's attainable for you, what, what makes sense as long as you try to keep yourself uh, being active. I think that was such great advice. Um, Anne asked, any recommendations for vitamins or supplements that you would rec uh, for net patients that might help? Um, I mean, once again, that gets back to a really depends it depends on what sort of surgery you've had you know if you've had a whipple pancreatectomy or if you've had some of your small bowel removed so that really really depends mm -hmm. um and that would be where working with a nutritionist 
is very important. Um, you know, there's, there's um, definitely some recommendation around niacin um, that people can become deficient in niacin if they have carcinoid syndrome, so needing to replace niacin. Um, really, it, it comes back down to if you have the ability to eat a really healthy diet, you should be getting all of your nutrients from your food. That is the most important thing. There's been no studies in the general population to show a multivitamin is helpful. Um, but, you know, if you've had part of your small bowel removed, you may become deficient in vitamin B12. If you are having a lot of fatty stool because you have pancreatic insufficiency, you may be losing a lot of your fat-soluble vitamins. So you may need to have those replaced. Vitamin D being one of the important ones. You know, we normally get that from the sun. Um, it's our main source. We do get a little bit from food. And um, we know that certainly in Northern California, where I am, a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D. So, so I think um, working with a nutritionist to understand what surgery you've had, what symptoms you have, you know, do you have carcinoid syndrome or not, um, and then you can test, you know, you can test the vitamin B12 deficiency for vitamin D. We don't generally check, test for niacin, but um, those sort of things, some of those vitamins can be checked to see if you're deficient. I, yeah, I, I, uh, I believe that some centers now have added nutritionists to their um, multidisciplinary teams as well uh, as, as a normal practice, which I think is, is so important. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't know how many are at this point, but I think more are starting to, and I think that's really important for them. Uh, I have a question from Valjean from South Africa. Hey, Valjean, thanks for joining us so far away. Love to see that. Is there any correlation... Um, between gallstones and carcinoid cancer? I've heard that it goes hand in hand. Have you, do you know any correlation? No, I don't, I don't know of any any correlation. Not, not to say there's not, but to right. my knowledge, I don't know of. Okay, and if anyone else, uh, you know, that's an opportunity. If anyone else has uh, knowledge on that, uh, feel free to chime in in, in, the, in the comments. The problem... So Jesse says, the problem I'm having is finding foods that are healthy and not setting off my carcinoid syndrome. I know mm -hmm. that's an issue that a lot of people deal with, which we've kind of touched on with, with diarrhea, but um, anything else about finding that middle ground of healthy and then also not triggering carcinoid syndrome? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, the other thing we have to think about is carcinoid syndrome is from metastatic tumors, right? You have an overproduction of serotonin. So if the carcinoid syndrome is such that it's really affecting your ability to eat healthy foods, then maybe one of the approaches is tightening up the control of either the carcinoid syndrome itself, so through the use of, you know, extra subcutaneous um, octreotide, um, telatrostat, or treating the underlying tumours more tightly. So, you know, sometimes when people have carcinoid syndrome that's really not well controlled, you need to treat the tumour. You need to get to the underlying cause of it. So maybe even though it's not, maybe it doesn't look like it's growing on a skin, but your symptoms are worsening, the urine 5-HAA or serum serotonin is going up, then it's time to treat the tumour. So that would be the other thing to think about too. Got it. Um, I had a question. Uh, um, you had mentioned Whipple surgery, right? I think mm -hmm. uh, someone had a very specific question about, can you have nuts? Uh, Wendy asked, can you have nuts after having a Whipple? Yeah, I don't, I don't know of any reason why not. No. Um, I think she, um, mm, I thought there was a follow-up question. Yeah, my, may, I think her doctor said no seeds, no nuts, raw fruits. She'd been whippled, but 
Just I mean, you know, it. maybe that was directly post operatively. Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about lifestyle changes, and I have a broad question about that, but I think it's a good point to um, to just talk about general things people can do and adjustments they can make uh, to their lifestyle to give their, themselves the, the, the best um, chance at this. We've talked a lot today about food, exercise. The question that we had specifically was, what's a first step that I should take? So someone gets diagnosed. This is a new thing for them. They understand that they're going to be on this journey for a while. Um, what's the, what's, what's the top of that list of changes you think they should address? Um, well, so, I know that's a big question. But. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where do I start with that one? So, you know, I think that probably the first question that they would want to ask themselves is, yeah. What, what do I want to achieve? Like, what are my goals? Because the answer is going to be different from everyone. And the thing is that if I say, okay, so everyone needs to do X, that's not going to resonate with some people. Right. And we know from human psychology that being told to do something generally is not enough. You've got to believe it in yourself. You've got to have, like, some internal motivation to get to where you want to be. So really sort of identifying what, what their goal is. They obviously, you know, usually the underlying goal is to stay alive. I want to treat this tumour and stay alive. But then once the dust settles, often it's, okay, I know that I'm staying alive, but I really want a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that may, mean, that, that may mean different things to different people. Some people may come to their diagnosis and be very out of shape and they realise, you know what, I need to get in shape. I need to get my cholesterol under control. I need to lose weight. I need to get hold of this pre-diabetes. I need to move my body. Other people may say things like, um, you know, that they need to get their finances in order um, and they need to get a will and a you know, a trust for their kids and all the stuff they've been putting off. So I think probably the first thing would be for people to really think about what are my goals? Yep. What do I want in the next three months? What do I want to achieve? And because I think thinking about I want to just radically change my whole life, it's too much, especially when you've got a new diagnosis. Totally. So really sort of thinking about what are, what are the most important things that I want to change? And over time, you know, identifying your team, this is, this is exactly why the wellness clinic exists because then you have the nutritionist help you with the, the food, the exercise counsellor to help you with the exercise, the social worker to help you with the financial stuff or the advanced care directive or, you know, whatever else it is that you need to get organised in your life. I think that's such a great life lesson, life point is, is identifying, well, what do I want out of this? Whatever you're trying to achieve, look at the end goal first. And then it's almost like you reverse engineer it back to that first step. So if I want this to happen, and, and like you said, there's so many variables to consider. Is it health focused? Is it family focused? Is it finance focused? And yeah. then once you understand what's what's the most important thing to you, is it longevity? You know, what 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 is it? Then you say, well, what's the step that gets me there? And then keep going back. And then you then it kind of uh, reveals or unveils the path forward, I think. And I, I, I think you can apply that to, to any goal. And so, yeah, for those of you out there that that are at that point, that's that's the place to start. I mean, I was going to say it's a great place to start, but I think it's the place to start. Where am I going? What do I want to achieve? And then just bring it on back to the steps to that very first one. And, and like you said, uh, establishing that team is, is, is of the utmost, utmost importance. Um, so got a few more minutes, about five minutes. So maybe we can get a couple of questions in. Uh, Kathy says, my potassium went high and I was told to eat foods low in potassium. So much for fruits and vegetables. What causes the potassium uh, to, to go up? That's a new problem for me. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be lots of different things. It's usually not from eating too much potassium because our bodies are usually good at regulating that sort of thing. 
Um, so I would think about medications. There's definitely medications that can raise your potassium. Um, the other thing is um, if your kidney function is not processing, it's not working as well and processing potassium, then that can lead to the potassium to go up. Um, so they're the two things that I would think about um, when someone has high potassium. Got it. Last question, probably. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, also from Kathy, does sandostatin ca cause an increase in blood sugar and, and elevate blood pressure? Ever heard it of that? It certainly can alter your blood sugar level, both up and down. Um, so, um, and then as far as blood pressure, no, not that I know of. I, we don't generally see that. And I don't know of any any change in blood, um, blood pressure with sandostatin. Um, you had mentioned something at the beginning of the program about support groups, and I know that's something we talk about a lot here as well, and then something that's been very helpful for a lot of, of patients. How do you all, meaning the, the, the wellness clinic that, that you operate, how do you all integrate or work with su support groups? Yeah, we have a really active support group on Norkel Carcinics, and we do every other month before COVID, now we're doing it virtually, but um, one month it would be at UCSA and then the alternate month it would be at the, which, the support group, which is in Walnut Creek. So we work really closely with our support group and have a very good relationship. Um, and I think it's been very helpful. Not everyone loves support groups and that is totally okay. People can get information in this sort of forum, I mean, there's lots of other ways, but sure. support groups, and, you know, they're advocates too. They're not just providing support for the patients. They're really great advocates for the patient and the patient's needs. So, you know, they, as I said, I, I sort of interview people in the support group to find out what they needed with the wellness clinic as opposed to just setting it up and telling people this is what I think you need. Um, so... Is that some in general though? You think it's a good suggestion for people to at least try out and see if it's a fit for them? I definitely, and you know, you don't have to go to a support group. I mean, just be connected with them. Great point. Um, and I think it is really great. Um, and just you know, a few things that, that we didn't touch on today, but sure. one of the things that I'd, I'd love to hear from people about is just the impact that their diagnosis has on people in their life, caregivers especially, how, how are caregivers um, managing and what do the caregivers need? So that would be that would be something that would be great to hear about um, because, you know, when we hear it, then we can try and be creative about helping. Um, and then the other thing is setting goals and trying to work on changes in, in your life, getting back to that previous question. Some people find health coaches really beneficial, wellness coaches, in um, helping them sort of identify what the need is. Uh, so that's, that's another resource for them. Absolutely. Well, that is about our time. Angela, any, any parting words for, for the zebras out there uh, that, that we didn't touch, anything that I didn't cover that you think is important uh, that you'd like to mention before we close out today's program? Um, I, you know, I just think that um, I hope you all know that as, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the healthcare community, that we, we understand how difficult it is living with a rare disease. Um, and we get a lot of our strength to keep doing what we're doing from all of our patients. Um, and anything else, I, I wish we could have a wellness clinic in, in every um, centre, but it's given me some, some good food for thought how we can actually have this service reach a bigger yeah, audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to work on that. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been, uh, I've really enjoyed, enjoyed this program. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thank, uh, thank you all at home, friends of the foundation for joining us again. As always, we hope this program has helped you, helped answer some of your questions. And if you have other questions, again, I reiter reiterate, reach out to uh, CCF at carcinoid.org, their website, 
or uh, here on the Facebook page, you can private message them if you have any questions. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Tercera Therapeutics. Without them, this program wouldn't be possible. My name is Rain Bennett. Thank you for watching. It is my absolute pleasure to host you every week. Please join us next time for Lunch with the Experts. Stay healthy, stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.